Hello, I'm Tom Moan, and for 22 years, I've been the Chief Executive Officer of One Legacy, the organ procurement organization serving Los Angeles and the greater Southern California region. Most recently, I have shifted to my focus to external affairs and governmental relations and public relations, and I am extremely pleased to be able to speak with you today about the issues of ethical issues in organ donation and transplantation. A quick introduction as to who we are in One Legacy. We are part of the nation, national network of 57 federally designated nonprofit organ donation agencies, often referred to as OPOs, organ procurement organizations. We have three primary functions, the broader facilitating the uh, recovery and transplantation of organs for, for transplant is our number one activity and takes up about uh, the work of about 80 to 90 percent of our staff of over 350 people. We simultaneously advocate for donor registration and increased uh, donor authorization and, uh, and transplantation. And we do public education to help the public see the need and value and benefits of choosing to make the gift of life. This is a map of California that shows you where we are. We serve the, as I say, the greater Southern California region of 20 million people spread across seven different counties. We have over 200 hospitals in the area. And uniquely, 70% of our population are non-white, uh, multicultural individuals. And 50% of our population are first or second generation immigrants. So a unique piece of the US donation and transplantation world. So how are we doing in our basic work? These graphs show you over the last decade uh, that we've increased donation 70%. A substantial improvement, of course, but still opportunity and need to grow. Fortunately, our organ transplants have increased 54%. Um, you can see reaching a high of 1,688 from one legacy alone last year, and helping the U.S. achieve over 40,000 organ donor organ donation and transplants in the 2021 year. It's most important to recognize that the ethical principles of donation and transplantation have been well addressed in, uh, for the last 50 plus years. And we'll touch on some of those things. Um, as a uh, matter of course, the major organizations that oversee organ donation and transplantation in the US are actively uh, engaged in ongoing discussions of ethics. This is just a sample page of ethical considerations published by UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. It's the, the federal contractor who operates the OPTN, the Orbit Organ Procurement Transplant Network here in the US. Um, and a variety of topics, including such things as the uh, ethical use of, um, of Considerations and continu continuous distribution of organ allocation, a dramatic change in the way organs are allocated here in the U.S., moving, for instance, from you know, allocating only to your local region first and only secondarily to the, the broader Western region in our case or the whole nation if there are no recipients in your local OPO recovery area. These um, allocation rules principles were changed in the last two to three years to try to get the organs of the patients in the greatest need within the anticipated logistical life of that organ for trans transportation to get to transplant. The ability to move that organ, you can't move a uh, heart across the country in for 24 hours. It needs to be transplanted more quickly, for instance. So we do keep some regional uh, um, elements of our allocation system but we do it with the notion that it should go to the first available best uh, match for that heart that is within that logistical region, not just the community in which it's recovered. You might imagine this has been an ethical issue of great discussion, and we'll see that uh, the issues of organ allocation remain some of the most important and most frequently addressed issues in donation and transplantation. In addition to the OPTN, we have a lot of input from the American Society of Transplantation, uh, they've uh, published on this, for instance, in their statement on ethics, on autonomy, equity, quality, all of the, uh, the issues and topics that we routinely see in, in donation uh, in ethical uh, analyses. And the American Medical Association has um, got formally published uh, opinions and perspectives and standards when it comes to organ donation and transplantation. 
that work that's been performed over the years, which we'll talk about, touch on in a moment, and has been built into our societies and our oversight bodies, has been built also into the fundamental laws that guide organ donation here in the U.S. Um, the states, each of the states uh, of the U.S. have a Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. It's called Uniform because it's based upon a one single standard, although they vary slightly state to state. But fundamentally, they define the rules by which each of the organ procurement organizations work with donor families and with healthcare institutions and medical inst inst uh, institutions and the law and law enforcement in ensuring that we respect the autonomy of individuals and um, the uh, hierarchy of who gets to make uh, uh, medical and, and uh, life decisions for individuals unable to do so for themselves. And you can see here that as ethics and logistics and technical aspects of donation, transplantation, and clinical practice have changed, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act in each state has changed, and so it's been passed three different times across the country. The overriding federal law of, that oversees how organs are allocated and who are the organ procurement organizations and what or, uh, transplant centers are licensed to perform is um, the, called the National Organ Transplant Act and the core elements of that act um, are the underlying underpinnings of the entire organ donation system and transplant system in this country. So the in each of these are based upon the ethical considerations that have developed over the years. Beyond the, uh, the laws themselves, there are certainly uh, organizational infrastructure. This is a uh, picture of the U.S. donation regulatory structure with those two acts, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act and the National Organ Transplant Act that gave right to the United States Department of Health and Human Services to oversee organ, eye, and tissue donation. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services seeing, overseeing organ procurement organizations and transplant centers the Food and Drug Administration overseeing uh, tissue banks and corneal banks, and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, overseeing the overall uh, organ procurement transplant network, oftentimes called the OPTN and, and its contractor, the United Network for Organ Sharing. So we start with well-established uh, discussions and ongoing vigorous discussions about the ethics of transplantation donation uh, gets con in. Uh, built into our legal structures and then built into our regulatory organization bureaucratic structures. And some of the uh, images of the various uh, organizations that do this work for us, the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the California Department of Health Services here for us in California, UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, our own Association of Organ Procurement Organizations, which oversees the uh, the operations and sets standards for our practice, and the iBank Association, which also sets standards for the practices of, um, of organ donation agencies. We continue to have oversight from the Department of um, Los Angeles County and every one of our county's uh, medical uh, examiner corners uh, offices, and the California Hospital Association is represented here because we have to have contracts with each of the hospitals in our service area, as I mentioned, over 200 here in Southern California. And our Donate Life California Registry, the donor registry uh, that has over 19 million Californians registered as donors, and there are over 150 million um, U.S. citizens, U.S. residents registered as donors. And each of these is founded on and incorporates uh, ethical principles that have been developed over the years. Some of those principles are, pr are nicely described here. These are from the World Health Organization, International Donation Transplant Ethical Guiding Principles. I think there are about, about 10 or 12 of them um, that are in a, a great deal of detail describing the, the expectations of those who participate in the work of recovering cells, tissues, and organs for life-saving and healing uh, transplantation starting with the, uh, can most importantly, be removed from the bodies of deceased purposes for the purpose of transplantation if any consent required by law is obtained, and if there's no reason to believe that the deceased person objected to such removal. A fundamental premise that we see in all of the uh, donation transplantation programs uh, of, the, of the developed world, and really, frankly, most of the world. Um, the, uh, the second principle they have is physicians determining the potential donor has died should not be directly involved in the transplantation to have remove any potential conflict of interest between the transplant physicians and those taking care of the individuals uh, who are expected to or have passed away. 
Um, one of the uh, issues that has been um, very uh, a subject to change here and around the world is no cells or tissues or organs should be removed from the body of a living minor for the purpose of transplantation, other than the narrow exceptions allowed under national law. And this is saying living donation is clearly a big part of uh, tissue transplantation, for instance, uh, for instance um, pardon me. <laughs> Uh, living donation is certainly a big part of kidney transplantation. However, it is very rare that it is advisable for a minor to uh, provide a kidney to uh, to another person. Although there have been exceptions in minor to minor transplants between siblings, for instance. These principles uh, carry on for as mentioned for a couple of pages, about twelve different principles. The uh, each one having a tremendous value and import um, in in defining what are the standards by which we should practice donation uh, across the world. Most of the discussion I've provided thus far and we would continue to discuss has to do with our practices here in the U.S., but the, um, the World Health Organization principles are firmly uh, uh, incorporated in and underlie the U.S. principles and principles of pretty much every country. And having done some work in Australia, uh, China, and, and um, Taiwan, and Korea, and Germany, and so forth, uh, it's, it's quite clear to me these are fairly well, very well adopted around the world. And of course, one of the things that really prompted the World Health Organization to be engaged uh, in establishing principles has been the issue of transplant tourism and some of the challenges that have resulted from it in uh, the coercion of cash payments to individuals uh, otherwise destitute uh, for in exchange for their living donation kidneys. And they're really not donation, it's more kidney vendors in that case. In that case. And um, these motivated uh, the World Health Organization to set some of these standards. And of course, they uh, resulted in the production of the, do the Declaration of Istanbul, which incorporated these uh, in particularly focused on the underlying ethics uh, to prevent transplant tourism and, and organ trafficking. Now, these foundational principles, whether they be uh, from the World Health Organization and whether they be tied back to the laws of each individual country, really had their uh, origin in the establishment of the ethical practices of, of medical ethics. When the very first transplantation transplants were done, there had obviously not been a robust discussion about the potential for transplant and where and how it might, should be done. But there was a strong uh, tradition of medical ethics. Certainly some of the very first um, transplants uh, that we, uh, we really start with 1954 with Joseph Murray's uh, transplantation of a 22-year-old uh, uh, patient whose kidneys were inexplicably failing, but who had a, an identical twin. Um, but it was not the first experience that Dr. Murray had had with a transplantation because a few years earlier while he was in the military as an Army surgical uh, physician, he and the team had a patient, a patient come in who had severe burns, and they recognized that he would uh, die without uh, treatment to prevent uh, the exposure of those burned areas, and, those, and he chose to transplant skin from a, uh, another uh, serviceman who had in fact died, and allowing his body to slowly regenerate his own skin, and ultimately save this individual's life. And it was obviously a transplant was not expected to last uh, years, weeks, years, or, uh, or, or a lifetime, but it was expected to help save the life of someone who would die without the gift of that skin the, uh, from another um, soldier. Now, at that time, there were there was certainly no um, established principles of getting authorization from family or from a next of kin or donor registry. Um, but that donor skin came from an ind individual who was deceased and it was made as a life-saving decision on the part of Dr. Murray and his team to save the life of the other. When the, um, uh, the, the opportunity came to help the um, uh, patient Richard Herrick who had kidney failure, um, there, was a, uh, there was a much more uh, controlled circumstance in time. And they was, uh, Dr. Murray consulted with a number of physicians within and outside the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, as well as clergy of a number of denominations and legal counsel before even offering this opportunity of transplantation. Because he knew that it would be essentially by violating the longstanding uh, Hippocratic Oath of do no harm to the donor 
um, but for the benefit of the donor's uh, relative, uh, the identical twin, and with the uh, notion that both lives could be saved and healed in that manner. And of course, that was the decision that was made in this case. Uh, and of course, it was in essential that it were was uh, entirely voluntary on part of the donor twin. From that 1954 uh, transplant, of course, these are some of the standard measures of uh, the milestones of advancement uh, of kidney from a deceased donor in 1962, a lung transplant in 1963, first liver transplant and heart transplants in 1967, all of which were groundbreaking and, um, and but still based upon some very fledgling developing uh, medical ethics. One of the um, early uh, writers in the area of medical ethics uh, in, in the U.S. has been Dr. Uh, Robert Veach, um, who published the book Medical Ethics, uh, this particular excerpt, and, and a number of prior uh, books on, on the, and, med and uh, articles on the topic, uh, talking about the base, its foundation in fundamental medical ethics. And this, this article, in fact, was about medical ethics in general and its application to organ procurement, in particular for transplantation, and recognizing that it's being, we're being forced, as he says, to make ethical choices that involve direct conflicts of rights and welfare of different parties in ways that is only secondary in the earlier issues of medical ethics. Essentially reminding us while there is a foundation of ethical principles and ethical practices that have been well applied in medicine and documented and incorporated in medical practices, um, this is a more complex area in donation and transplantation. There are the milestones that we, I was discussing here, 1954, 1962 for the deceased donor kidney, lungs in 63, liver and heart in 67. And, um, Dr. Veach's uh, commentary about the unique complexity that donation and transplantation give to fundamental medical ethics. That said, the principles of medical ethics applied that were applied by Dr. Veach and others, and really the very first conversations that uh, Dr. Murray had uh, with lawyers and um, clinicians and, and, um, and uh, religious leaders, uh, really focus on these principles of, of ethics. Beneficence, uh, the obligation to do good and uh, benefit. Non-malfeasance, the obligation to do no harm. Autonomy, uh, informed consent, that an individual gets to determine whether they want to have a transplant and whether they want to be a donor at, without coercion and, and, um, and bias that may, may come from uh, financial incentives. Justice, um, on equal distribution of resources, not as a critical an issue in the case of a living donor transplant from one twin to another, but the moment that we have a deceased donation, we have, how do we share those organs? Who is the, uh, is the greatest value from getting it and what the greatest utility? Um, but also, who, uh, what is the fairness of access to that transplant? And these are the fundamental five uh, principles that we continue to work through over time. Um, in living donation, as we mentioned, um, will the transplant benefit the, the patient? And non-malfeasance, will the donation result in harm to the donor? Um, we know that the, any un, otherwise unnecessary surgery will result in harm to a donor, but is it recoverable and can the donor maintain it a, um, a full and rich uh, quality of life? Added to that was discussed great deal of discussion around the issue of the psychic and psychiatric and psychological benefits of donation versus the cost of those for someone undergoing living donation uh, uh, and, and providing a kidney or a section of a liver, for, perhaps, um, to a to another person. Um, while the uh, physical act of surgery uh, does have a, a malfeasance component, the recovery may offset that. Uh, will the psychological benefits offset that um, the, the the pain, suffering, and perhaps lingering after effects of, of transplantation of donation? These are um, these are core elements of the discussion of non-malfeasance and doing no harm. And of course, autonomy is the donation freely given with or without coercion or incentive. And utility does the benefit to the recipient outweigh the harm to the donor? And in other words, will the kidney that's transplanted last? Will it perform its uh, function effectively? And um, will the donor continue to be able to live a healthy life? 
To see stonation, these become a little more co complex. Uh, the the, the transplant benefiting the patient is, pretty, is fairly straightforward if a patient is dying of kidney failure, liver failure, heart failure, and so forth. The non-malfeasance. Um, while you will not, you cannot, uh, under laws in most countries, and certainly the recognition in, in most religion, in really all religions at this point, that a deceased individual is no longer a sentient human being and uh, is not subject to injury, um, so you cannot harm them by recovering the organs. But there is a secondary effect: will there be harm to the donor family member or the community, or um, in some other way, be it psychological or otherwise? Uh, so those factors have to be considered in establishing the rules, laws around organ donation of the deceased donation. And of course, autonomy is that donation freely given, it is a, without coercion, is the um, family offered payment uh, in the U.S. In most countries, that is illegal to offer the family payment. Uh, fam payment is offered in Iran, in the Iranian system, for instance, and it's structured into their laws. Um, but they're still having a, it's still getting a free choice to make that decision. But in most of the world, payment is, is not a, uh, allowed to ensure the autonomy of the decision um, to, give, to give the gift freely without coercion. Um, again, back to justice, do all persons have equal access to organs and transplants? It's one, uh, the criteria for who gets the transplantation are many, and we're going to talk about those in, in just a moment, uh, the justice part being one of the greatest continuing challenges. And again, uh, utility. Does the benefit to the recipient outweigh potential harm to the donor, family, and community? And will it, in fact, benefit the recipient? That, all of that said, most of those principles that we've just run through have been, are the foundation of the, uh, the laws, the practices, and the standards that are uh, followed by the governing and oversight agencies that I cited earlier. But the continuing ethics, uh, ethical questions, um, autonomy. First person authorization versus family authorization, or perhaps presumed consent. In the US, we have a very robust donor registry system, uh, which individuals register their legally binding choice to be a donor. Um, and in the US, these have dominance over families' decisions to not donate. Uh, so there is no option for a family to overturn that. Whereas in presumed consent countries, which uh, are legally saying that organs are property of the state, the government, and can be used for the social and community good, um, under the strict reading of the law, what is sometimes referred to as hard presumed consent, um, these would be recovered and there is not first person nor family authorization. That said, virtually no country in the world actually practices hard presumed consent, and it's more of a soft, known as a soft uh, opt-out opt um, system rather than a hard opt-out system. And families do get to make a decision whether their loved one be a donor, or an individual gets to have a pre-recorded decision to not be a donor. A donor registries, can my family refuse to donate? As I mentioned in the U.S., they cannot, and sometimes this results um, really on a Every two or three weeks, we'll have a family who has an initial um, reaction of, of opposing donation. In 99.9% .9 of the cases, we help a family through that, and it's not an issue. Once in a while, it is, and courts have stood by the individual's uh, first-person authorization and their choice to donate. Um, in one area of uh, donation, donation after the uh, circulatory determination of death, where an individual is in an operating room um, and, the, and extubated because there is no chance for recovery and they would have been extubated and, uh, regardless of donation, there are occasions when physicians have um, said that they believe that the uh, first person authorization it does not apply in that case. Uh, the experience in U.S. law says it does, but we continue to have occasions when those issues are brought up by physicians and hospital uh, ethicists who have concerns about that, and we have an ongoing effort to uh, get everyone on the same page on that topic. And a question that comes up now and then, should executed prisoners be donors? Um, there are a myriad number of issues. The number one concern is if the prisoner chooses to be a living donor with the hopes that they will get some commutation of their sentence. Um, that is generally uh, frowned upon and not allowed in, in the U.S., and I, I believe so in most of the world. But it is um, more problematic when you look at executed prisoners in the, in the uh, older traditions in, um, in the People's Republic of China, and where uh, there has been well-documented evidence and, and acknowledgement by the Chinese government that uh, executed prisoners were, be used, were being used for um, donation and transplantation. And uh, the Chinese government is an active effort to uh, de uh, develop their voluntary donation system to prevent that from happening. 
Should we pay people to be donors? This gets back to the real issue of coercion, but it remains out there a question of is there value to doing that? Or is there a price because then only the poor become donors? And we might look at Iran and, and most of the research in that arena says, in fact, the poor make up the vast majority of the uh, deceased donors and living donors, but deceased donors in particular. And that can be seen as problematic. And we see the paying of uh, folks in third world countries uh, and, um, and aspiring um, second, first world countries and places of India and Pakistan and uh, various parts of, uh, of South America where we have seen payment to individuals in contravention of laws, but in fact happening and in, in leading to uh, problematic outcomes for those, for those donors. The non-malfeasance issue um, in our donation after uh, circulatory determination of death, DCD, um, we do have occasions of question about should the organ procurement organization uh, have any role in the care of that living patient, even when the decision has been made that they will be extubated and, ter and, and care terminated because they cannot recover. But while they're living, should the organ recovery agency play a role? In the U.S., that role is routinely limited to they can offer recommendations and advice to the treating physicians to ensure the maximum uh, viability of organs once uh, death has been declared and the organs are recovered, but not, fed, not actually participate in that, in that care and treatment of the still living patient. And there's been some discussion, should we even, uh, by uh, individuals such as uh, Dr. Ethicist Dr. Truog about should we in fact recover these organs prior to death because more of the organs will be viable. Um, an interesting utility argument, but with some uh, grave concerns for this issue of the line between um, uh, treating living patients and deceased patients. And of course, the um, issues of beneficence, what's the value to those who are healed versus harm to those who donate those benefits, which I think we talked about earlier um, as well. Justice, who should be first in line for a transplant? This is, and these are some of the ongoing debates. Should it be the longest person waiting the longest? The person who's the sickest? The person who's most likely to get the greatest gain, the greatest graft survival, the greatest additional number of years? Uh, should it be the person who's closest to the organ? Or should it be some combination of all of these factors? And then there's the question of, should it go to the person with better insurance and financial ability to pay? An area which on the surface sounds uh, grossly unfair, but the, and, it, and it certainly is unfair because it's uh, based on socioeconomic status. But an individual who gets a transplant needs to be able to demonstrate that they can maintain that organ's viability by ensuring continued medical treatment and care after transplant and showing that they have um, the resources to get the immunosuppression drugs and the like. We are also asked the questions under justice, should we allow people to jump the list to save an organ? Sometimes the effort to place an organ will go um, through thousands of, of potential recipients, all of whose uh, themselves or their physicians and surgeons have said no and declining on that organ. But there may be someone farther down the list and the organ is approaching the time in which it's no longer going to be viable. Should we jump the list to get it to that patient in need? Interestingly, in the US, there is no codified methodology of doing this. But you know, see, United Network Organ Sharing, who oversees these allocation, says if that happens in order to save an organ, they uh, will contact the organ procurement organization every time that an organ is placed outside of sequence, uh, the natural sequence in the list, and seek a justification uh, that the amount of effort to, to place that organ and the amount of uh, declines and the number of hours is taken to that and how much time is, would be left in that organ if they continue down the list. Most uh, routinely, these um, skipping of lists are approved, but they are a tremendous oversight to ensure that we keep the equal access and justice. Um, there is a requirement for caregiver support systems prior to listing, which I mentioned earlier. Sometimes a real challenge for people who have to get to different parts of the country to get a transplant. Um, they don't have their caregiver support with them here in Southern California. Uh, we get a number of patients from the Las Vegas, Nevada area because they only have a kidney program. Patients who need a liver or heart or, or lungs will come to Los Angeles, but they don't have family uh, to take care of. They don't have a home to live in, and they need resources to cover that. If they don't have those resources, is the system discriminating against them, challenging ethical issues that we continue to debate to this day? One of the big debates recently has been COVID vaccinations of recipients. Are they Should they be required? Should they be required of living donors? Um, 
I think the argument is for that they are valuable to recipients has been well argued and, and uh, demonstrated uh, because of the increased risk of, uh, COVID, of uh, transplant recipients to COVID infection and the higher death rates of those uh, infected uh, who are transplant recipients. Uh, prior to vaccinations than the general population, but a much uh, lower rate of, uh, of death and illness um, once uh, vaccinations have been found. On the other hand, should their donor be required to be uh, vaccinated? That debate still goes on. One Another debate that comes up regularly is should registered donors here in the U.S. where we have this robust donor registry system, should they get a priority to organs should they ever need a transplant, a transplant in the future if their organ, if they give one kidney and the other fails? Um, there is some, uh, some effort to make that happen, um, but uh, not entirely formalized uh, yet. But it, uh, there, there seem to be efforts to move in that direction with the notion that they have given this gift and uh, they have a higher priority need uh, because they have put themselves in risk. And we want to ensure we do not um, uh, do harm, unnecessary harm. And um, then the, the, one of the most uh, challenging issues of all, for instance, should someone be allowed to get a third lung transplant? Someone who has successfully uh, weathered lung transplantation, for instance, or any other transplant, um, but has been subject to rejection and uh, can, uh, needs a second and or third or sometimes even fourth transplant. Should that be allowed in the, in the interest of justice when other lung transplant repatient, uh, patients and uh, recipients uh, might be passed over and may die while waiting? These are continuing ethical controversies that uh, we face uh, here, and we will continue to face these as here and around the world until we have a, uh, essentially an, in, an infinite supply of organs, uh, which is not in the near future. Some of the resources uh, used to create this presentation that might be valuable to you. First and foremost, I know a lot of this conference is about the issues of organ donor research. The National Academy of Medicine in the United States produces opportunities for organ donor intervention research. One Legacy was a uh, partner in helping ensure that uh, was able to happen and participate in some of the dialogues there. And it's a, a robust consideration of the ethical uh, questions surrounding this, as well as some of the logistical questions surrounding organ donor research. When you are treating an organ donor uh, to exp uh, experiment with new treatments that will ideally improve donation success, do you need to inform recipients that that, um, that deceased donor who cannot give and does not need to give informed consent for those uh, that research since they are deceased, but the recipients who get their organs are not? This is one of the most challenging aspects of this discussion. And I will tell you, the jury is still out on this, but the, the resource from the National Academy is valuable in making this uh, continuing discussion and, and result. And finally, uh, these are a number of the citations of the, of the many uh, articles and publications on the ethics of donation and transplantation, and uh, I hope it will be of value to you. So finally, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our experience with uh, organ donation and transplantation ethics here at One Legacy in Southern California in the U.S., and our con uh, continued efforts to help learn from and share with our colleagues around the world. Thank you very much.